Business African Pod Business Forum. And our guest is a businesswoman who believes the finest path to success is the simple act of empowering other people and creating opportunities for them. My name is Philip Nyako, and our guest, Kandu Belt, is a relentless entrepreneur and a public speaker who has written three books while running a mining exploration company in Australia. Nicknamed Queen of Africa, Kandu Belt speaks five languages. She lives life in its full spectrum, feeling comfortable in high heel shoes in boardrooms and wearing safety boots out in the bush. She has even interviewed the Nobel Peace Prize winner, the Dalai Lama of Tibet. Most of all, this businesswoman never stops learning. So to start the thoughtful business conversation, I asked Nkandu how she came to believe so strongly that if you learn how to learn, you can learn anything. About learning how to learn, I uh, learned uh, this uh, phase from uh, Tony Buzan. So Tony Buzan uh, is a, was a great friend of mine. He passed away last year. And uh, he is the founder of um, Mind Maps. So he created or invented the Mind Maps. And uh, it's a very good way of learning how to learn anything new and also how to retain the information. So having, to, having used the Mind Map over a number of years, I realized that, you know what, you can actually learn anything. But you have to have that you know, ability of learning new information. And then the best way of learning something is to teach it. Because once you learn something, and then you share that information with other people, you retain that information much faster and better. And that yeah. says quite a bit about your background as a person, which yes. I'm interested in. Yes. Tell me about your background. So I was born in Zambia and uh, lived in Botswana and the Netherlands before coming to Australia. Um, my mom is uh, from Zimbabwe and then my dad um, is uh, yeah, half Congolese, half uh, Zambian and then yeah so we've got roots all over Southern Africa um, yeah so grew up in a very very big family um, my grandmother was a teacher my great-grandmother was also teaching um, my grandfather worked a lot in our community development so I grew up um, in a family where we were always involved you know in the community and always looking out for other people as well and uh, growing up, my grandfather emphasized on this philosophy of Ubuntu. You know, I am because we are. That is a direct <laughs> translation. I did uh, study journalism and news writing and then did uh, some business uh, courses and studies. So there's, yeah, I've studied quite a lot of other things. Uh, yeah. So you've got uh, appreciation for business yes. in your blood, as it were. I did. I started my first business when I was 10 years old. What business <laughs> was that? <laughs> well, I started by selling fat cakes, you know, so um, my father uh, has got accounting background, so he was an accountant, but um, he didn't believe in so much as to giving us money, but teaching us how to earn money. So if we go to the shops, we could choose whatever we wanted, but he would not hand cash to us. Uh, what, what does business really mean to you? Because in many ways, yes. you've got a heart yeah. uh, that leads you to give, yes. which in some ways is, can be a little bit different from many business principles. It's very true. But, you know, the whole idea of business or what business means to me is solving the problems in the community or, you know, on a global scale as well. And by saving, you know, vast numbers of people, you're actually getting paid to do that, to solve other people's problems. So you can also solve people's problems and make profit, and that profit can be used for purpose. So at what point did you choose to learn in order to be able to learn anything subsequently to drive your yes. passions forward? When I, uh, when I started the business of you know, selling fat cakes at the age of 10, what would happen was we would have our school setting, right? And then students had to go outside the school grounds to go and purchase, you know, fat cakes. So, and I thought, okay, what if I save them the time of going outside the gate and I bring them in my lunchbox? And then they just, yeah, 
buy from there, they will have enough time during recess to also play. So that was that was one. But then as I grew older and uh, started to appreciate, you know, solving problems, but then also going into that philanthropic um, role, um, helping other people, I realized that, you know, poor people can't help anybody. So you can still be a good person and make money and also help a lot of people. When you say poor people can't help anybody, it's quite a, a profound statement. It is a profound statement because um, at some point, um, as you can see, um, I've done a lot of not-for-profit uh, ventures in, in my life. And I found that there was a stage where I was personally struggling, you know, financially. But, you know, um, and then in terms of uh, my social and uh, charity work, I was excelling. So it became, I, I was, became sort of like stuck with thinking, okay, I either have to get a job and look after myself or I have to choose the charity and be dependent on other people. And when you are in that stage where you're becoming dependent and then you're running a project and you have to apply for grants and, you know, seeking grants, you know, doing fundraising activities, it's good, but in a way it sort of disempowers you. So that's when I started uh, learning about, you know, how can I be financially sound and still be able to serve vast numbers of people and creating opportunities for other people, you know, for them to learn and also to look after themselves so that, you know, we create more leaders into our communities. So that also led me to reading this, uh, one of these great books by Dr. John DiMartini uh, called The Values Factor. And according to Dr. DiMartini, he says that our lives are divided in uh, seven areas. So let's say, for example, um, you've got seven tanks, right? And uh, one of these tanks, let's say one is the financial, the social, the physical, you know, the family, um, spiritual, and in any area where you are disempowered, somebody is going to overpower you. So if my finances are very low, but then my social life is very high, you know, that's not living a balanced life. So is how do you find that balance? Yeah. When did you <coughs> latch onto yeah. that all-encompassing uh, philosophy? It, I think it happened about three years ago. Yeah. I'm a slow learner. <laughs> <laughs> But you it, will eventually learn. I eventually learned, yes, yes. So, and because uh, I read a lot, I love reading. So, I'm always reading, always listening to um, audiobooks and, uh, you know, and also studying the greats, you know, like looking at um, the past leaders, what have they done, and including, you know, our kings and queens, especially, you know, Africa, so much, you know, wealth um, and, and, and knowledge. And then looking at what, you know, the, the Nefertiti's and, um, you know, and Zinga, all these queens and, you know, what they did then. And then thinking, okay, how can, be, how can some of those principles be applied to business today? And it's all about, you know, creating a, a, a platform where other uh, leaders, you know, are created as well. And having that clear vision and mission. Because when your vision and mission is clear, everything sort of like takes care of itself. And just listening to you, watching you yes there's something that seems to come from within yes which is a sense of self-assurance yes is that really how you feel i always ask myself what's the worst that could happen i can fail so what i won't be the first person <laughs> but i will start all over again but um i'm a very uh spiritual person and i believe that you know this is my destiny this is what god has put me on earth to do so I know that, you know, whatever I do, whatever challenges come my way, they're there to strengthen me. So I have that strong belief that, um, yeah, this is what I'm here to do. I understand you speak quite a few languages. Tell me about those languages you speak. Yes, w yes. What are they? So um, two of them are, you know, my mom's language and my dad's language. And then the other three, I had to learn them as a, more of a survival <laughs> skill <laughs> technique thing so when we lived um in zambia zambia has uh, 72 languages and uh there's the five major languages and we moved from one place to another with um 
you know, my dad's job. So he worked uh, with uh, CUSA Zambia and they would get their funding through uh, World Bank. So they looked a, a lot after uh, farmers. So when we were in Dola, which, you know, is, yeah, Copper Belt, um, we speak Bemba there. But being Bembas, which is also my, uh, my tribe, uh, we sort of like, um, like speaking it everywhere we go. <laughs> so, and it's one of the biggest, uh, big, uh, big, big groups in Zambia. And then uh, from the eastern province, uh, we speak Nyanja. And uh, yeah, so I, I lived in, uh, in Katete. I was born in Katete. My grandparents have a farm there. So it's also one way of you know, communicating with other people. And then uh, Tonga, I learned Tonga to uh, communicate with my friends. So I had two of my friends who were from Southern Province. And I thought it would be nice if I could speak to them in their language. And I just fell in love with, uh, with the language itself. It's, um, it's like French, but African. <laughs> <laughs> So, so uh, just yes, tell yeah. me, um, maybe using your hand, yes. how many, and, and just so, mention um, the yes, names yes. here. So I've got Tonga, um, Bemba, Nyanja, Lozi, and Sitswana, and then a little bit of Dutch. How does your head <laughs> <laughs> remember all those words, the different expressions, the yes. different ideas expressed in different ways in, yeah. all of, in all of those different languages? I think um, when you start learning uh, the language, um, especially for young kids when we started, um, you become a bit of a, a slow um, learner because, you know, there's a lot of processing that's happening in your, in your head. And uh, even like now, I've only started dreaming in English. So that means that my English is getting better because my English was suffering <laughs> because of the other, other languages. But um, yeah, it's just automatic. It's like learning how to swim or learning how to ride a bike. So even like now, when I'm speaking to my father on the phone, and uh, he will say to me, hold on for your mom, the language automatically just changes. Yeah, because mom made sure that she spoke to us in her language, and my dad always spoke to us in his language. It's very... Uh humble of you to say your English is improving because <laughs> there's nothing about your English that shows you are lacking in any way, shape, or form. Yeah. Uh, so you left Africa. Yes. Eventually went to Europe, the Netherlands, yes. and ended up in Australia where yes. you've been living now for yeah. you know decades. Yes. Uh, what have you learned yeah. through those travels that influences how you hold yourself out, yeah. particularly in a business uh, sense? I found that, uh, you know, the travel has given me a lot of exposure. You know, so I've learned a lot to be tolerant, uh, to think outside the box. And uh, in Bemba, we have a saying um, that, um, you know, a child who doesn't travel always, you know, thinks that the mother is the best cook. So, um, but, you know, and uh, when you travel, it, it opens your eyes and then you become more tolerant. You learn more. You see how other people, you know, do things and then you can go, okay, yes, I will adopt that, um, I will leave that and yeah, and then create something for yourself. So after these years in Australia, yes. there are a number of things you've achieved in a personal sense, but yes. I'm interested particularly in the uh, you're running a business yes. right now, which yeah. is a mining exploration company yes. uh, called, you know, Belts, named Belts, <laughs> <laughs> Belts uh, uh, Mining. mining. Yes. Um, I would probably, I'll, I'll be asking you a little mm. bit about that. But first yeah. of all, then, yeah. how did you begin to, because from age 10, yes. you started being a business Selling five person. Checks, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. When, on arriving in Australia, yes. how did you switch that passion yeah. back on? When we arrived uh, in uh, in Australia, I was um, yeah I was eight months pregnant yeah so that's what thirty eight weeks that's almost yeah almost <laughs> full time, and um, my husband uh, is an obstetrician so that was okay we were allowed to fly. Um, so I did a lot the of... The advantages um, of being married to, to a doctor. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So I was... Um, yeah, so when I came in, I sort of like uh, took a step back to observe. And uh, that step back was me volunteering with uh, Save the Children Australia. So I would spend a couple of um, days, um, yeah, 
going there and looking at what are some of the challenges the community was facing and how could I, you know, be of service to my community. So, and then after, yeah, about a year or so, I was given, a, yeah, so I was actually given a role with them um, about three weeks into, um, into my volunteering uh, yeah, projects. And then uh, because I love media so much with my media background, I would also do a little bit of um, radio, you know, three days a week with the Aboriginal radio station, uh, Warangari Media, which I really loved. And we would have all these conversations with all these different community members, you know, children, students, um, elders. So that also gave me um, a sense into, you know, a deeper sort of like perspective in what was happening in the community. And then looking at my talents and my skills as to how can I best um, be of service yeah, to, to, to my people. It makes <coughs> me wonder too, uh, how do you go from purely wanting yes. to be of service to others yes. to making that service and yeah. the time you put in, the effort, the creativity, yes. the talent, how do you mm. turn it into something profitable? You know, they say that, you know, you find what you're good at, right? And then find the gap in the market, and uh, and if you can combine that, that's you know your sweet spot, you know, and find somebody who can pay you to do that. So I believe that you know through creating um, a business that saves vast numbers of people, um, you're actually yeah helping other people. What I realized when I was doing a lot of the not for profit things was that when you're giving out money or you're giving out free service, people were not very much appreciative of that. And what would happen was, um, even with my public speaking, and people would say to me, oh, we want you to come and give a keynote speech. So I'd be like, okay, um, this is how much I charge. And they go, oh, but you are not for profit. So I said, uh, no, right now I'm running my own business. And because it's taken me a lot of time to study and you know, to craft my art and to also pay, um, you know, fees to even like, uh, you know, professional coaches and mentors for me to be able to be, to give that speech that is going to be inspiring and impactful because you just don't want to talk for the sake of talking. Yeah. So the shift was um, when I was talking with, uh, we, we had a trip to Zambia and I was talking with my dad and, uh, and, and, and my husband and, uh, and I said, you know what, I want to do something and create something and help people. I really want to make meaningful change. And then dad said, if you want to help people, create employment opportunities for them. Because if you employ somebody, they're going to pay you know, school fees for that child. They will put that money into the community, you know, either by you know, whether they're buying food or, you know, so the money is circulating in the community and it's improving people's lives. And if you can just employ one person and they pay for their child to go to school from grade one to grade 12, you've done something. And it becomes meaningful to you. Exactly. So in the course of your life, you've also yeah. written at least three books. Yes. Tell me about those books. So the three books I've written. So the first one, um, I Have the Power, Unlocking Your Potential to Change the World. Um, and in there, I talk about, you know, some of the challenges and, uh, and hardships and some of the winnings that I've had in my life, yeah, so that people actually get a balanced um, view of, you know, life. Because sometimes we look at people who are, you know, inspiring and we think, oh, they have it easy, you know. And sometimes we go, oh, why am I not succeeding fast enough? So in this book, um, I Have the Power, it's actually very, very raw. Um, it covers a lot about my childhood. So from the time that I spent, you know, um, six months in hospital because I was poisoned and the doctors thought I'd actually not make it, to, you know, me meeting with the, the Dalai Lama and having these wonderful conversations and being able to travel and speak in, you know, different universities and and companies and schools around the world. So it's sort of like um, just saying, uh, yeah, this is how I did it. These are the steps, and this has been my life. This was what was good and or perception, and this was, yeah, what I thought the, the highs were. What about the second book and the third? <laughs> the second book, um, Fierce and Fabulous, The Feminine Force of Success. So that book is actually very much focused on business. So, and uh, also on women. And this book I was inspired to write uh, because of my mother. 
So when uh, World Bank um, pulled out of Zambia, um, my dad lost his job and we were slowly sinking into uh, poverty. And I remember mom in the kitchen looking at me and she said, um, I will not, you know, and she said to me, I will not let us sink into poverty. I'm going to turn this story around. And she and uh, my dad, uh, you know, did so much to move us from that to another country. And then I, w- I started to look at what, how many other women are actually doing this, you know, making it possible for their family to go, okay, this is not how the story will end. And then the third book, um, which is uh, Fierce and Fabulous, Phenomenal Women in Network Marketing. I was very curious about that because network marketing is an industry that has been shunned upon for a very long time, you know, where people go, oh, it's a bunch of women selling Tupperware and uh, having a cup of tea or something. Um, But I have a lot of friends in this industry and some of them make like $20,000 a month. So I thought, okay, let me collect these high achieving women in this industry and uh, find out how they're making so much money. And uh, when I started doing that investigation, I found that, you know, it's a lot of education. So, yeah, teaching people about marketing skills and then also having a product that is actually going to be useful to somebody. So the two last books, they're more, um, yeah, business Business focused. Yes, yeah, business oriented, yes. I was just thinking that Mm. many African women, mothers particularly, will very much identify with your your mother's personal yes. experience because there are millions of them yes. day in, day out yes. doing these things yeah. in their own way as yeah. a form of business exactly. to keep afloat. Yes. So it's it's inspiring. It is inspiring and I think that we don't appreciate, you know, our mothers more often and what they've done for us and, and the challenges that they've actually gone through. Because, you know, every parent, you know, you and I, we want our kids to do better than us. You know, so we will go above and beyond to create that environment here yeah, for them. So you've had this significant interaction Yes. Between you and the Dalai Lama. Yes. Tell me, what was the circumstance leading to it? Because it's not a regular thing <laughs> for uh, someone to have a significant interaction with the Dalai Lama. Yes. So, um, yeah, I think because I've worked in the media a little bit, but um, in 2012, I was selected as a, a young social pioneer by Foundation for Young Australians. So basically at that stage, what um, FYA was doing was they would be looking for um, 12 brightest minds in the country and then bring them together and coach them, you know, both for for business coaching and also to develop, you know, uh, projects. And with that, uh, I got a lot of connections and, and contacts as well. And relationships are very important. So, you know, maintaining your professional relationships. So when the Dalai Lama um, was coming through, I am not entirely sure who put my name forward. So um, I don't know whether it was, you know, somebody saw an article in the paper or they had my radio interviews. But um, I just got a call from the event organizers. I remember it very well. I was uh, actually in Bali. And, uh, yeah, and then said, oh, his Holiness is coming to Australia and we would love you to, um, to join him. So I said, okay. I accepted that. And uh, a few days leading up to that, and then I was told, yeah, we, we're having this uh, conversation. And then I was given the briefing of, yeah, what to do, what not to say, and uh, which was really fantastic. How did that and go for you? Because <laughs> there is that famous photo of you and yes. the Dalai Lama. Yeah looking into each other's face, connecting was, in it, a special way. It was a very good connection, I must say, and his energy was just uh, incredible. Um, I'd met leaders before, you know, like other thought leaders and, and, and presidents and stuff, but meeting with the Dalai Lama was very special and his, just, his energy was just incredible. So, and I remember walking there with my microphone, I was a little bit nervous. <laughs> Because this should. is this is this is a live interview, two thousand five hundred people in the audience, and I'm thinking to myself, I hope I don't ask a question that will make me famous on YouTube and say you know all the wrong things, you know. So I um yeah, but as soon as I 
walking towards him, he just held his hand out and then I put my, my hand in his hand and he held it, um, yeah, almost the whole time as we, as we talked. And it was just, yeah, the interview went so well. And, and It must be yeah. one of uh, the most significant experiences in your life, just yeah. given yeah. who he, he is, the yes. position he occupies yes. in world history. He does, yes. And, uh, and one of the things was that, you know, sitting there with him, um, it was like the whole universe was quiet. It was that level of calmness where we could have, you know, a meaningful and deep uh, conversation. And we talked, you know, we talked about women's rights, you know, a lot of things that are close to, to, to my heart and, and also to his heart. And, um, yeah, and how to be a good person and, you know, happiness and its causes and things like that. But um, most importantly was, for me, the biggest lesson was how he made me feel. When I walked out of that stage, he made me feel like I was the most special person. And I said to myself, if I ever interact with anyone from today, I want them to walk out feeling the way he taught me, you know, on that stage. I want people to feel appreciated and loved and know that, you know, I acknowledge them. The way he made you feel. Exactly. And I made a few notes about you as a person, obviously. So uh, you're the Pinnacle Professional of the Year 2013, Women in Leadership Victoria AMA 14, African Pioneer of the Year 2015, African Australian of the Year 2016, (laughs) Young Leaders Commissioner G200 2000. 16. Yes. It's interesting that we are actually recording this yes. on Australia Day <laughs> 2020. 2000, exactly, 2020, yeah. yeah. Which of these accolades or recognitions yes. mean the most to you? Um, all of them they do because uh, even the one that I received last year from the United Nations uh, Association of Western Australia um, was also one of the wonderful ones. Uh, all of them, they mean a lot. But when I say this to people, that they actually come as a surprise because I do what I do because I love doing it. And um, so when people acknowledge me, it's, um, it's special. It means that you know, somebody out there is watching and they're appreciating what I'm doing. But um, I feel I was born to do this. So yeah, it's, it's, just, it's just nice. It's really nice. The other thing you yeah. are proving you're born to do is to run a business. Yes. And now you're running this mining exploration company. Yes. How, <laughs> <laughs> how, how is that going for you knowing that in mining, mm-hmm. you end up having to, to put millions of yes. dollars into the soil mm-hmm. and not getting anything back for a long time? Exactly. How's that going for you? What's been your experience so far? Well, I think I've been very lucky in a sense that, you know, um, I've been able to think outside the box. So I look at challenges uh, from, you know, as exciting, exciting things. So when I, when dad said to me, um, you know, create employment opportunities to help people. And I thought, okay, what can I do that is going to employ a lot of people? You know, and I'm going to make money and they're going to make money and then we're going to also make money for the shareholders. <laughs> mining. What do I know about mining at that stage? Yeah, indeed. What do you know zero. about mining? <laughs> <laughs> at that stage, zero. So I thought, maybe I go to school and do a course. Or maybe do the Richard Branson way. You know, get people that are smart in that area and explain to them the vision and the mission and then let them do it because this business is about managing people. And when you manage people well, those people, they're the ones that actually build the business. So I'm in the business of leadership and management. And my team, you know, which I'm very lucky to have, they're the experts in mining. So they make that happen. So what is the status of Belt Mining so far? Okay, so um, we've started an exploration program and uh, we've got a couple of uh, concessions, uh, mining leases uh, in Zambia. We've also got uh, uh, a company uh, in Zimbabwe. And uh, so it's very important to focus on um, one thing at a time and, and do it very well. So right now we are exploring for copper. And uh, it's, it's, yeah, we, we're hitting like really good, uh, yeah, good, good grades. And I must say that um, 
it's a very risky business, you know. So when you lose, you lose big, and when you win, you also win big. And uh, in May um, last year, we, you know, some of the leases, we, yeah, we were not doing very well after spending quite a lot of money. So when you spend quarter of a million and uh, you're starting to lose, um, <laughs> the emotions kick in, <laughs> you know. <laughs> but I was taught that um, people that can't manage their emotions, they can't manage money. So between um, June last year and December, I had to really, really learn how to, you know, manage my emotions and make sure that, you know, I'm not excited or, you know, depressed so that, you know, my emotions are not like on a pendulum. So we have to, yeah. On an even keel. Exactly. So I um, so started learning how to do that and then really focusing and then sitting down with my team and going, okay, what is it that we really want to achieve? Which are the best leases do we need to concentrate on? And uh, yeah, and then we did that. So you've got to have to think outside the box sometimes. So would you say it's a, another process of growth for you in managing a mining exploration mm -hmm. company at this stage? Yes, it is. It is, yes. yeah. But what I want to do is I just don't want to stop at the exploration. I want to go all the way through to um, full-blown mining because I find that, you know, most of the resources are in Africa. You know, we've got so many reserves in Africa. Um, the policies uh, with uh, most of the governments uh, in African countries, they're improving. Um, if you look at Zambia, Zambia has a very consistent uh, mining code. The population is growing very fast. And I think um, Africa, uh, you might know this better than me, um, that we're going to hit, uh, I think the population would double. Exactly. There's going to be a <coughs> population explosion in Africa. Exactly. It's the new frontier. Exactly. So with that, you know, there will be need for infrastructure. There will be, you know, need for, you know, food and all the other industries, right? And looking at us also going green to create those, you know, the renewable energy, you know, we need, we need copper. It's about thinking into the future. Uh, in Sitswana, we have a word, uh, developilu, yes, yeah, so looking into the future, and then, yeah, start working backwards from there. You know, it's nice to hear that, uh, yeah. using a different language, a different <laughs> phrase, because yes. it gives me an insight into how yeah. your mind works. <laughs> yes. Because as you're speaking, yeah. you're able to connect to so many different concepts. Yes in different languages, the way they ex express, yes. in a way that is far more meaningful to you than, say, yes. someone who mm. might not be bilingual. Yes, yes. Yeah, because <laughs> yeah, sometimes you, you think, uh, you, I, I think in my language, and then <laughs> have to translate, translate it. it. <laughs> I think that's the benefit of, uh, yeah, coming from, you know, Africa, and it's just a melting pot of different cultures and, and languages, and, and just having that privilege to be able to learn and to be immersed in uh, all these cultures, it, uh, it expands your mind. And here you are, mm -hmm. as an Australian and an African, how would you describe the process of going through um, the system, as it yeah. were, seeing yourself transformed, making yeah. the effort to keep learning? What are the mm -hmm. things you learn out of it? that you would like to share? Growing up, right, as a child, we lived in different places and spoke different languages and were, you know, mixing with different cultures. So I always used, I, I never saw myself actually as just, you know, an African. I, I always sort of like blend in somehow. And uh, yeah, so I would just go somewhere and yeah, I'll just fit in. And be in and, Kandu. And just be in Kandu, yes. Yeah, because that's all I was used to. So even when we moved to Kananara and I had a very fun encounter where this person said to me, oh, you're black. And I was like, oh, am I? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, breaking news. <laughs> exactly. Because, you know, like, so I know I'm African and Africa is in me and I'm very proud to be African. And, but sometimes, you know, I speak sarcasm. So... <laughs> But then, uh, but even like when I go into uh, a board meeting, I go there as, you know, can do. And I also take, you know, my African roots with me. I take, you know, the courage and the wisdom of my ancestors with me. So in, with that, I can go anywhere and I'll be comfortable, you know. Take me to Buckingham Palace, I'll be fine. Uh, leave me in the middle of Timbuktu, I will still be fine. 
Yeah. And I look at you based on the research I've done yes. on you to say, you're this woman who wears uh, steel cat boots <laughs> and then you also wear high heels. Yes. And you can carry a hammer. Yes. And a pen. Yes. And yeah. be what you want to be. Yes. And, uh, and, and, and drive a, a dump truck and uh, get the shovel. And <laughs> I think... Um, I think it's just, you know, being just being able to, yeah, being able to do, because when you have a team, right, and we are in the bush, you know, when we're doing the exploration, um, you have, you can't be a leader that just sits back and then watch your people do their thing. You have to be there digging, you know, like you will see some of the photos, I'm there, you know, digging, breaking ground, um, you know, looking for outcrop, you know, copper outcrop, and uh, and just being there, getting dirty. And that's also the fastest way for me to actually learn what my team is doing because these people, they are skilled. They've gone to university. They've worked in this industry for a long time. So by being actively involved, I'm also uh, learning. And then, of course, I do gala dinners and, uh, yeah, I like looking good and put some lipstick on and still be a girl because I'm still, you know, <laughs> I am a girl, so I still want to look nice. Yeah. No, it's a pleasure talking yeah. to you in Kandu. Yeah. As a girl, as a woman, <laughs> a business owner, Thank you. and everything else that you are, some of which this uh, interaction didn't even cover, but it's yeah. been a pleasure. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's been really, really wonderful. I had a great time. Thank you for coming. Thank you. See you <laughs> next time. <laughs> And that was the thoughtful business conversation with Nkandu Belts, a businesswoman who speaks five languages, lives life in its full spectrum, feeling comfortable in high heel shoes in boardrooms and wearing safety boots out in the bush. African Port Business Forum is produced by African Port Media in Perth, Silicon Valley of Mining, Energy and Business. Subscribe free to our audio podcast. We are on Apple Podcast, Spotify, Google Podcast, or wherever you listen to your podcast. To find us on YouTube, just search for African Port Business Forum. Our website, africanport.com, has more information, including photos and articles of interest. Follow us on social media by searching for African Port. And don't forget to check all of our previous interviews with exceptional guests all on African port. Thank you.